Uh, we are very happy to have uh, Xiaole Wu from Fudan University um, telling us about homological stability for ribbon Higman Thompson groups. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here virtually and uh, talking about uh, my recent work on homological stability for the ribbon Higman Thompson group. So, so this is a joint work with uh, Rachel Skipper. So, and uh, so I know many of you are probably familiar with uh, homology stability, but Thompson groups, you probably are not that familiar with. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, talking up, talking about uh, basics about Thompson group first, including the history. So uh, let's start. So. So history of Thomson groups. Uh, so the groups, as there is actually three groups, F, T, and V. They were first defined by Richard Thompson uh, in the 60s. And T and V are the first known example of finding presented in things simple groups. And these are actually the motivation for Thompson to introduce these groups. So I should also say, Thompson is a, a logician, many and who also study groups. There's another Thompson who is also, who is more famous, right? We got uh, who is a fierce medicine. And he also studied groups, but uh, finite simple groups. So these are two different concepts. The other one is John Thompson. Okay. And then later, so the Hickman uh, generalized this notion of uh, Thompson group and uh, uh, he gets a family of groups, what we call nowadays the Hickman Thompson groups. And then in the meanwhile, uh, in the 70s, uh, Fred Heller, an independent didact, uh, they rediscovered F as the universal group encoding a free homotopy as important. So I should say, uh, I'm not that familiar with uh, um, what exactly does this mean, but uh, the key thing is uh, there's some topologists, you know, when they study topology of space, they found F, you know, somehow F miraculously appears there. Okay. And, and for my talk, we're also interested in sort of surface version of uh, Thompson group, that's the Brady Thompson group. And uh, these things were first introduced by Brain and Dahoney independ independently uh, in 2006. And uh, in 2017, uh, Schumann introduced what we call, what he called Ribbon Thompson group. And then later, well, just this year or last year, the Bridget and Ribbon version of Hickman Thompson groups were uh, first studied by Aroko Kobonido and uh, so, um, so, so this is sort of the history, but there's one, another sort of parallel line to the Bridget Thompson group uh, that is, uh, in 2004, Funa and Kaposhi, they introduced the uh, asymptotic mapping class group on uh, infinite type surface. So the kind of surface they studied is a uh, sphere minus cantor set, but they are also talking about disk minus cantor set. So the, the group they are introduced uh, is a subgroup of the mapping class group of sphere minus cantor set or the mapping class group of disk minus cantor set. Okay. And and uh, somehow these groups turns out to be strongly related to uh, uh, the ribbon Thompson group. Okay. Okay, now, now let's, let me define uh, the Thompson group V using pair tree diagram. So an uh, element in V is a pair tree diagram. Uh, so you got two trees, T1, T2, and then there's a bijection, sigma. So, so sigma is a base. So the trees are two finite rooted binary trees with the same number of leaves. So the leaves are just, you know, I saw two trees here. So the leaves is just the lowest uh, vertices. So both trees has three leaves, right? And then a bijection, I'll indicate in the bijection by putting labels on the leaves. So here is one, two, three. And then I'm putting one, two, three here. And then this will give you give me an element in the Thompson group, except uh, I will need to module out our equivalence relation. And the equivalence relation is also very simple. So, so 
what I'm going to do is sort of I imagine both shades are sitting inside the infinite binary, rooted infinite binary chain, and then I can, sorry, maybe I should. So originally is one, two, three, one, two, three, right? And then I want to say it's equivalent to another one by adding carrot. So this is the expansion. So, so I'm adding a carrot as the leave two, and then I leave adding a carrot as the corresponding leave. And the bijection is done, you know, by mapping the left one to the left one. So you, I label them by two A and two B. Okay. And, and then with this equivalence relation, now you can actually define the modification. So, so let me explain to you. So, so you have two trees T1, sigma T2, and then uh, T2, sigma prime T3. So this is the easy case where the two trees are the same. And then uh, it's, it will be very easy. So it's just T1. Uh, sigma, sigma prime, and T3, okay? And then when the two traces are different, uh, you need to use the expansion to make sure the two traces are the same. So sort of you imagine these two traces are like in a, you know, infinity root binary tree and then just taking the union that will give a tree which contains both. Um, but but you probably have never, uh, never seen these things before. So let me just try to give you a concrete example to show how the manipulation actually works. Okay. So, so this is the first tree. So let's say, so my, so let's say one, two, three. Oh, maybe making them um, a little more complicated. So, uh, sorry, can I ask? This is a partial multiplication, right? Even if you're using, if you even if you're using uh, equivalence classes, right? So basically, you're defining a category. Is that right? Sorry, say it's, it a, is it, it's just a partial multiplication, right? No, it it is a multiplication. You can do inverse also. You can multiplication from. Left so any right. two trees are equivalent. No. But so I'm, the modification is by, so an element is a paired tree diagram. It's not just right. a single tree. Yeah, but then, then you're saying that T2 has to be on the left, has to be equivalent, I guess. So uh, yeah. T2 on the right, right? So that's a condition. Yeah. And, and then I'm saying when they are different, I can try to using the equivalence relation to make sure these two trees are the same. So then any two trees are equivalent? Uh, that's then. not true because the equivalence relation changes both of the trees in, in the pair tree diagram, right? So, so, so I'm changing. So when the, how does the equivalence relation works? Is this equal to uh, some other tree by adding a carrot? Then there's a, some sigma prime and T2 prime, right? Yeah. I'm not saying the trees are the same. I'm just saying, the pair of three diagrams representing the same element. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let you go on. I, and there's something I quite don't understand, but uh, you might go on. Uh -huh. but, but yeah, but please ask, because I think uh, the, the first time I saw this, I also got confused. Um, but OK, so, so now I want to say T1 sigma, say, yeah, so this pair of three diagram. So the other part, how does the multiplication exactly work, right? So maybe I'll having a different tree or with, let's making our life a little easier. Okay, so one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So now these two traits are different. You cannot directly do multiplication, right? So the idea is you're trying to using the equivalence relation, meaning I change, you know, this, these two traits correspondingly to make sure they're the same. So the step, 
So first I realize, you know, if I go to the left, there's one card here. So what I can do is I'm adding a card here. But the advanced relation says if you are adding a card here, you have to, to do it here. Okay, so I label them by 3A and 3B. So, and 3A and 3, 3B. Right, this gives a new path tree diagram, which is the same as before, which is equivalent to the previous one. But now I'm adding, um, I'm at a point, these two trees are already the same. Well, I purposely sort of uh, uh, draw a simple case. So after one expanding, the, the two trees are already the same, but now I can do multiplication. So, yeah. So one, and the other tree is like this. And then the labeling will tell me how the bijection works. So one, two, three, four. And then what well, you can check in, right? One is here and mapped to this vertex. And this vertex in this picture is three and three is mapped to here. So that is where does one map to. And then two in this picture is here. And that is mapped to here in the first bijection. But two is really in here, right? You only identify the tree, so that is mapped to here. And then you can continue. And then that tells you how exactly the multiplication works. Okay. And, and then you can define FMT similarly. So, so, so V, remember, V is a pair tree diagram where this sigma is bijection. Sorry, maybe I, between leaves, right, of the two trees. And, and T, you change the bijection, you know, you can, you're not using any bijection, but you're using cyclic permutation, cyclic permutation. Meaning you preserve the order after cyclic permutation. You know, you have two tree, one, two, three, the other one, the other shape probably looks like this. So, so the way you, the only way you are allowed to label them is one, two, three, one, two, three, and one, two, three. So it's cyclic ordering. And the F has to be, you know, preserve order. So that's sort of the only thing can happen is identity. So for F, you actually do not need to, to indicate in, uh, what the bijection is, right? So in particular, F is a subgroup of T, which is a subgroup of V. Okay. Uh, and it's also interesting that Thompson V can be viewed as a subgroup of homomorphism of the Cantor set. And, and you can, so you can view these things as follows. So you, so you're, you can imagine your tree sits inside an infinity rooted binary tree. Okay, and you know this sort of you know, building our expansion, and then the ends of it is a copy of Cantor kind of set, and the ends of this side is also a copy of Cantor kind of set, and then your map, so so your labeling tells you, you know, one say one two three. So how does the ends below this leave? maps is going to map to here. And then you are from here that tells you how exactly all the ends are mapped to each other. So that gives you an element in the homomorphism of the Cantor set. Okay. And then there is this notion of Hickman Thompson group, which can be defined uh, almost exactly the same. So so remember, so element in V, so so this will be VDR. And D is sort of the, the valence of the carrot. I is sort of the number of uh, components of the tree. So remember V is defined as this T1, sigma T2. 
where where T1 and T2 and T2 are finite rooted binary tree. Right? The first thing you can do is uh, while well, you don't have to use a binary tree, right? You can use DRA tree. So what does it mean? You know, in V, you're using characters like this, but you could have in, you could be something like this. So the other thing you can change is you don't have to use in trees, you could use in forests. What does that mean? Uh, is an element in VDR is is a pair of is a forest, so consists of R trees. So it's T one, T two, T R. Then there is a bijection between the leaves of them, and then T one prime, T two prime, T R prime. Okay. And the equivalence relation is exactly the same as before. It's, uh, you just do the expanding and there's a natural way to do, to uh, introduce the new bijection between leaves. Okay. Is there any questions or did I confuse you? Okay. No, it, uh, so sort of, I can answer my own question now. So, so the statement I made was true. Any two trees are equivalent, and you embed them into just this large binary tree, which is leveled and, and has full branching at every point. So that's why your composition works. Yeah, yeah. You start off. Yeah. Right, okay. Um, so, so, so no, that, that's fine. I mean, I just wanted to say. So the answer is yes. So any two trees are uh, equivalent under this, and then uh, why this is an interesting thing is because you have to transform both uh, both the source and the target tree sort of uh, to be the same in, in the same yeah. way. And then you can do multiplication. Right. Right. OK, thanks. Yeah. Your way. Yeah. OK, and, and then uh, why V? Uh, this, uh, so V is sort of very interesting because it, mark, it has many IUR um, properties. So the first one is V contains all finite subgroups. This is very easy to see. So because you know, if you're choosing the two trees to be the same and the, and sigma just to be any bisection. So this will give you uh, a subgroup of V and uh, <clears throat> which is isomorphic to the permutation of the number of the leaves of T, right? So since the, since the number of leaves can be as big as you want, so you're getting uh, any finite subgroups. The second one is uh, Brown proved that V is of type F infinity. So on the one hand, it's very big, it contains all five subgroups, but on the other hand, it is of type F infinity. So there's kind of some tension going on. Uh, and that, the third property is the density in homomorphism of the Cantor set. Uh, this is not very hard to show. Uh, you can try as an exercise. Okay. So the last one, which is sort of important to us, is uh, Schmick and Wang showed uh, in 2019 that uh, V is acyclic. So, so this means that the hom reduced homology of V in, in physical patients is equal to zero. Okay. But, and uh, which brown and which wall? Uh, this is King Brown. Okay. From Cornell. Yeah. And this is Lapani one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and and because this is important, uh, I should say how 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 you know, in two lines how the proof goes. Uh, they, they show uh, how do they show V is acyclic. Uh, so step one uh, is a homologous st stability argument, where uh, you get a family of groups from Higman Thompson group V two one, small than V two two, small than V two n. And then you can keep on going on. And the inclusion map is very simple. It's just, you know, you, if you're having, say, T1, sigma, T2, sorry. Or you can, you can map to T1 using a, a root, you know, is also a tree, sigma bar, and T2 using a root. 
And the bijection is just map the leaves of T1 to T2 using sigma, and then this single root maps to this single root. And they can continue this way. This, you know, this gives you maps from uh, B2n to B2n plus one. And uh, what they were able to show that is uh, as star of B2n goes to as star B2n plus one is ISO for any star and n. Well, this looks very strong because usually homostability has like a stable range, right? But the, 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 the thing here is these groups B21, B22, they, they are kind of like self similar. They actually are all isomorphic to each other. So if you show like after sufficient, after, you know, when A is sufficiently large, it is isomorphism, you are automatically getting from B21, the map from B21 to B22 is also isomorphic. Okay. And then step two is they identify the stable homology. And be, you know, because of uh, you know, this isomorphism is in any degree and uh, from any point, so the stable homology is actually is, is the same as the homology of V. And, uh, <clears throat> and so what we are going to do is we, we want to build a surface version of this. You know? so, so, so V is kind of like a commutation, right? It's commutation group. We want to build sort of a surface version is like, from computation group to braid group. So, so that's, uh, the, that's our plan. We want to build a sur surface version of their result. So, so, so first we need surface version of, of their groups. So this has already been defined in literature. So um, the definition is also very simple. So the, so the first one is a braided V. So what you do is again, is a pair tree diagram and T1, T2 are, are finite root is binary trees. And uh, the only difference is previously here, B is a uh, bijection between the leaves, but now you change it to a, to a braid, okay? So that's the only difference. And, and when we draw the picture now, we, we sort of draw a little differently. We draw uh, the second tree upside down, just so that we can, we can draw the braid uh, easily, okay? Okay, and the equivalence relation is also just something you can imagine, right? So um, you, you sort of split the, way you can add in a carrot, so you can add in a carrot here, and then you just draw two parallel lines between them. There's nothing funny going on here at all. Okay, split a strain into two and then uh, they are parallel to each other. Okay, and in the same way, uh, you can define braided Hickman Thompson group. Well, now you split a strain into D strands, so yeah, but everything stays the same. And, and, and then there's also, you know, instead of using braid group, you can also use uh, the ribbon braid group. So, definition. Uh, so uh, element in the ribbon braid group is, you know, in the braid group, you're using these strands, but uh, in the ribbon braid group, oh, sorry, maybe, you know, connecting some points. In the ribbon braid group, what you do is you using, instead of strands, you're using bands, okay? Mm -hmm. Of course, if your, if your bands has no twist at all, this will be just the same as uh, the braid group, but, but here what you can do is you allow twist, self-twist of the bands, okay? And that will give you the ribbon braid group. And it's, you can, so to make our life easier, we're actually assuming that the band has to, has to be a foot twist. The number of twists of a band has to be multiple of foot twists. And then you can show that uh, the ribbon Thompson group 
is isomorphic to a braid group, semi product with Zn, where this Zn is coming from the lambda two base of each band, and the braid group acts on Zn by fact through the permutation and then acts on it by permuting the coordinates. So there's two facts, in, you know, sort of important to us later is one is the the braid, the braid group can be identified with the mapping class group of a disk with n functions. And the pure ribbon braid group can be identified with the mapping class group of an n whole disk. So it's something like this um, with some holes. It is pure because uh, mapping class group has to fix the boundary point wise. If you want, you can also, you can also allow permutation between the inner circles and uh, by putting on parameterization on it, and then you can get in the ribbon braid. Okay. And now you can define the ribbon pigment Thompson groups. And so everything stays the same. Um, you know, you have a tree on the top, and you have a tree on the bottom, and and you're using a band connecting them. So maybe this last band has some twist going on. Okay, but the equivalence relation now is uh, more complicated um, because so so previously sort of we just split each exchange into two, but now the equivalence relation is by splitting each band into two. Okay, or into D components. If your band has no twist, then it's the same. You're getting two parallel bands. But if your bands are, has self twist, then you're getting two bands or D bands uh, linked together, and each each band itself will have the same number of twists as the as you split before. Okay, but but besides this, everything else stays the same. So the question. For for from for the ours is you know is BV also a cyclic because we know that a V is a cyclic and how about ribbon Hickman Thompson group? So I know that that uh, BV is a cyclic has been asked for quite some time. At least uh, Matt Zarinsky has asked me uh, two or three years ago, and at the time uh, it's sort of indicating people has been wondering for some time. And it is knowing that the first homology of BV is zero. And this can be proved sort of by brutal force because you can find a presentation of the of braid B and then you can calculate the homology. I think the same thing can be done uh, for ribbon B. May I ask a question? Mm -hmm. uh, is the braided version an extension of V by infinite braid groups? Yes. Yeah, because remember, so, you know, Mm -hmm. yeah. So is it natural to expect that it's a cyclic? I mean, given that the braid group has homology, um, do you not? Very, uh, yeah, very good question. It? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, here, in, um, so the the homology of this is not finally generated. That's one thing. And also the, the inclusion map is different from the inclusion map of the euro, you know, when you're adding one strength. The, the here is like you it's like P B N goes into P B two N by splitting each strain to two and then you're taking the union of them, right? Uh -huh. The euro way is is by adding one extra strand, right? That is the inclusion map, but here the inclusion map is, is different. Yeah. But somehow you expect that the induced map on homology is, is a trivial map. Um, yeah. Interesting. I, um, no, sorry, I should I should not say say that. I should say the opposite. I, I expect expect it to be uh, to be non-trivial. So actually, V is simple. So this is a simple group. So if 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 this homology is finally generated, then you will get that uh, the action of V 
on, on finite generator, abelian group has to be trivial because B is simple. In particular, it's not does not lie in automorphic group of finite generator abelian group. Uh -huh. And and then and then you can actually deduce that, you know, if this is finite generator, you can deduce that uh, the homology of B, BV is coincides with the puberty group. But that is not the case because the kernel has infinite generated the uh, uh, first homology already. All right. Yeah. Okay. So sorry. Um, so how how one might prove BV is a cyclic? So so the idea is we can run the exactly the same machinery as uh, Lacanois and uh, uh, and uh, did. so the first step would prove a homology stab stability argument, and that turns out to be not easy because you know think about how you prove grade group is, is satisfies uh, homology stability. You use the fact that the braid group has is a mapping class with of disk minus uh, and can, uh, disk with n map points, and then using some surface topology to show some complex is highly connected. But uh, but what we are able to show that is uh, the ribbon Thompson somehow is the ribbon Higgin Thompson group satisfies homology stability because for the reason that we can actually build a symmetric model for these groups. Okay. And and so so. So let me start into talking about the basics, about um, uh, how do, does one show a, a family of groups that satisfies homologic stability. So there's this framework by uh, Oscar Randall Williams and Nathan Iwa called uh, homogeneous category. So, so basically you have a monoid category and it's called homogeneous. It satisfies the following three conditions. The first one is there is initial, the second one is on AB is transitive or to B set and, pre, and the post -comp composition. And uh, the, the third one is sort of already not that trivial. It, it, you know, if you're just coming up with an arbitrary category, it does not satisfy this. So out to B goes to out to AB, taking F to identity is injective. That's not hard. But the second one, you want the image to be exactly those automorphisms that fix B point-wise. Okay, uh, so, so I should say that these conditions might be strong, but the, they also provide a framework sort of, uh, if you're having any family of groups, there's a br brutal force to produce such a category. So it's not a problem. So the category is not a problem. And, uh, and then uh, the difficulty becomes uh, how to show uh, most stability and that, usually requires you to show some spaces highly connected. So, so, so say your target is trying to show out to x goes your out to x plus x and then goes to out to x plus n and, and this is your family of groups and then you want to set to show that this satisfies homologic stability and uh, And, and then uh, this, this complex arise. So the, so the vertices are very simple. You just uh, morphisms from X to X plus N. And the simplices are also very simple. Uh, so you, you just, you know, if you have P, P plus one of them, and then all you need to do is find a map from plus one copies of X to uh, N copies of X. And such that restricted to each components that gives you these maps from F0 to Fp. So everything is very natural. And uh, of course, this space is usually very complicated and depends on very, whether you are lucky and you can show homology stability. So the theory is, says that you, know, you have this homogeneous category and then you, are, you have this space is highly connected, which basically means uh, the connectivity of, of the space increase as an increase actually goes to infinity. Yeah? And then you get in homology stability. 
means this homology is isomorphism when n is uh, much bigger than i. So, so I didn't say the precise statement, but uh, that's not important to us. But you can find the pre precise statement in the paper. Yeah. Okay. Is there any questions? Hmm. It seems I, I go much slower than I, than I expected. Uh, so maybe I'll skip how does the proof for braid loop goes. So I'll come to, so, so for a proof, I need to build a model for the ribbon hickman thompson groups. And uh, that turns out, so, so these are models somehow for, for the ribbon thompson group already, but there's also some confusion in the literature that there is at least in two papers where they say that is the same as, so that is the asymptotic mapping class, class group, but they sort of confuse the ribbon thompson group with, um, with Brady thompson group. Actually, there's another paper uh, this year got confused again. Um, so, so, but anyway, so our model is coming from this thing called, from of, of Nan Kabuji called asymptotic mapping class group. And what they do is they need to, to sort of, they want to give you an infinite type surface. So that's Dick's man's can set. They put, they give you a rigid structure so that this surface will have exactly sort of very parallel properties as infinite binary trees. So on the this side, we have infinite rooted binary trees, right? And on this side, we have this minus candy set. Of course, I draw the this candy, minus candy set in a, in a sort of weird way, right? The euro way is, you know, you have a disk and you have a, a copy of candy set. But you imagine this, the points in the candy set are very heavy and then they sort of pull the surface to infinity. And then that's the picture I draw. So, so I want to, to, to have the surface has the structure like an infinite, infinite root binary tree. So what I do is I first give a pants decomposition of this surface. Okay, so that's the thing I'm going, I'm doing here. Okay, and then, uh, so, and then this sort of gives a, a suit, uh, infinite, Kind of tree-like structure because the pants is kind of like a, a carrot, right? A carrot is like this. So, and then that I have pants, and then suited. So the suit subsurface will play the role of finite uh, root binary tree, finite root binary tree, and this is just connected union of pants. And uh, and base. Oh, okay. You want to be finite. So this is the base. Well, in this case, it will always contain the top uh, top pans, right? And then and then you know in, in a tree, if you have a carrot, the and if you know where the leaves are mapped to is sort of automatically clear where things are mapped to, but for pants, if you, you know, if you just know the, the boundary loop, uh, where does the boundary loop are mapped to, um, it's still not clear what the maps are. So for that, we want to have a parameterization of the pants. So we have map to the pants. And and then I will be able to know where exactly, if you give me n two pants, I can tell you how I can have a map from one to another, okay? And with this preparation, I can define the asymptotic mapping class group exactly as I, how I defined uh, uh, Thompson group. So, so I will have, so instead of pair tree diagram, I using pair surface diagram and uh, sigma one and sigma two a suited subsurface with the same number of suited loops. So suited loops are just the uh, uh, lower boundary loops, okay, of this 
of the sooty subsurface, which plays the role of the leaves. And, and phi is a homomorphism from sigma one to sigma two, or well, coincides with the parameterization of the because I have parameterization of the pants, so there will also be parameterization of the sooty loops. And the equivalence relation is now, you, you know, you, if you have a sooty loop, say here, a uh, sooty loop subsurface, and then you can, you can extend the map by adding a pants. But in, if you know where these pants are mapped to, there will be a unique map because I just using the parameterization. Okay. So I have the equivalence relation also, right? So in this way, I, I define uh, a group. You know, I define by, by declare two, two such pairs are equivalent if they are isolated to each other. And then you can, you can also define for general D and R just by increasing, you know, the number of uh, roots. So in this case is the number, you know, you can having a D whole disk and then attaching a rigid disk minus, can, uh, a disk minus can set with rigid structure. And then to increase D, instead of using pants, you can use these kind of things. Okay. So nothing special is going on. And, and then, Sort of, so an element in sigma one phi sigma two um, naturally represents an element in the mapping class group also because you can keep on expanding. At the end, you you getting a homomorph homomorphism from disk minus candy set to disk minus candy set. This is very different in, in the in the Thompson group case because you never you never you almost never have a automorphism of the tree because the two trays you start are different, but in case sort of, we have a homomorphism from the suited subsurface to itself. And then you declare element to be asymptotic rigid, you know, if the course in the mapping class group, it, if it can be represented in this form. And more generally, if you, if you have two surfaces equipped with rigid structure, you call, um, a homomorphism between them is totally rigid if it's rigid outside some suit surface, meaning you know, outside the suit surface, there is a pants decomposition and the parameterization of the pants. And the maps from, from everything outside the rigid subsurface is coincides with the parameterization of the pants. Okay. So re the results we have is uh, this asymptotic mapping class group can be identified with the uh, um, ribbon hickman thompson group. And the key, key thing is that um, we use that the, the mapping class group of a disk whose end host can, is the pure ribbon braid group. Okay. So now, now I finally come to, sorry, I'm, um, yeah, so maybe I, so the homogeneous category for asymptotic mapping class group. So the objects, so sort of I call it X0 is just a disk, and then X1 is this disk minus candle set equipped with a rigid structure. And then Xn is the same, or uh, is sort of is disk with n holes, with n copies of holes removed, and you attach it. Uh, this with minus can set with rigid structure. And the monoid, monoid operation, uh, you have, in order to do the monoid operation, you have to put in a, so parameterization of a small interval in the boundary. So this goes to the boundary and that tells you negative zero, one. And for each one of this, you can do And the monoid operation is just exactly doing boundary sum using this uh, parameterization of the boundary. So this is zero, one, and negative one, zero, and negative one, one. And by identifying these two shapes, also two intervals. So this is Xn, this is Xn. So you are getting, X n plus n. 
sorry, I'm over time now. Is it uh, okay that I continue for maybe? Oh, you have you have fifteen minutes. Hmm? You have fifteen. Oh, sorry. Oh, I got totally confused. I have fifteen minutes. Oh, sorry. Yes. Okay, now I'm not worried. No. <laughs> um. So yeah. Okay, I was wondering why things go uh, so fast. Yeah. Um, so the morphisms, yeah, now I can yeah, need to relax. So the morphisms are home of Xn to Xn can be defined as follows, following. And when N is bigger than M, so it's just defined to be empty set. When n is smaller than n, so it defined to be the ribbon Hickman, sorry, the asymptotic mapping class group in this case. Or is the isotopic classes of isotopic classes of asymptotic rigid homomorphism from Xn to itself, right? And when n is smaller than n, so this will be a pair. So the pair consists of M minus N and then a map F. So, so if you know the, how does these things work, so it's always like this. So you actually starting with some different category and then uh, at the end, this different category will produce a category with morphisms looks like this. But anyway, I should explain to, to you what these things are. So, so F is, uh, asymptotic rigid homomorphism from Xn to Xm. So this is an asymptotic rigid homomorphism. And then the equivalence relation sort of says what F does on, on the first component does not matter. So, so you can compose this with a uh, Asymptotic reach the homomorphism of, of this component, and that does not matter. Okay. And, and then the complex arises uh, is something like the following. Um, so the vertices are just, you know, just home from x1 to xn. So it, it roughly just, you know, one copy of disk minus counter set that goes to sort of a boundary sum of n copies of disk minus counter set. And, and you have a, it maps to something here, right? That's the map does preserve the base point and uh, it maps this to the image via a synthetic region homomorphism. And you also want the complement to be home asymptotic rigid to, so this complement is asymptotic rigid to x n minus one. And then now, if you have a p, if you have a p plus one of them, if the image are pairwise disjoint and the complement is you know, set by some conditions, and then you are they are forming by p simplex. Okay, and. Uh, and, and I should say that this complex is very complicated and as then we, we need to deal with this complex, it takes quite an uh, effort. And that we, we sort of step by step, it boils down to some other complex. And other thing is, uh, so our proof is, as I said, we want to build a surface version of the Shimik and Wasa results. So our proof is also actually exactly parallel to, to their proof. But uh, the, the difference uh, is, in our case, is way much harder because we have to deal with all kinds of curves. Yeah, and, and at the end, our proof boils down to to something called uh, we call lollipop complex, and we need to prove this complex are uh, highly connected. So maybe I should say what these things are. So so the key gadget is um, called lollipop, and. So what is a lollipop? A lollipop is something like this, okay? So 
so so let a x to zero to two uh, where one and two identify. So that is exactly what I show on the right. And a lollipop is a map. Okay, it's not exactly this. It's a map from a zero zero is a base point to disk minus scan set. Well, equipped with a rigid structure. Um, <clears throat> Uh, maps which maps the base point to the base point and satisfies so L is embedding uh, and then you want L12 map to one of these suited loops. So these suited loops are loops coming from this uh, pants decomposition. So this boundary of these pants, okay, coming from you know, that's which is coming from the rigid structure. And, that, and then the zero one part is just an arc. So in the picture, I can, so in the picture, I sort of draw the rigid structure in a different way. This is d to three, i to three. So I sort of looking from upside, from, 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 from the sky and uh, looking at the rigid structure and that gives you uh, a picture that looks like this. And, so a suited loop, uh, a lollipop could be something like this. It could also be something like this. Okay, yeah, and that's the lollipop part, right? And that's the, and then, oh, and then the, the complex is also very easy to define. Uh, so, so the vertices are just isotopy classes of lollipops, okay? And if you have P, of, P plus one of them, and then, if they are pairwise disjoint outside the base point, they will form a P simplex, except we, we're adding uh, one more technical condition is we, we want, we want um, at least one suited loop lies outside the disk, disks bounded by these LIs. So this is a technical condition sort of making our complex actually the dimension of infinity. But, but it was sheer, yeah, I don't. So, and with this, we can actually show that um, this lollipop complex is contractible. Okay. And uh, so, this is like if, if you know that how the somehow I, I feel I got the time wrong. So, uh, if, if you look at the, the proof for the braid group, uh, at the end, you, you're proving some for some arc complex. Yeah, maybe I should say that. So, so in the proof of the braid group, at the end you're proving some arc complex, there's a base point. So an element is an arc connecting the base point and, uh, and one of the mark point. And if you're having P plus one of them, they are, they're forming a P simplex if their power is disjoint outside the base point. And this complex is actually also contractible. So our, our theory is like parallelism. Moreover, so, so these suit loops actually plays the role of mark point, right? Except this mark point sort of, uh, they can split. And one sort of can keep on splitting into two or three and then keep on the, the mark point sitting inside mark point. But still, they, they, they are like they are like a counter version of the of the R complex in in, in the proof of merge stability for 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 a braid group. So and and the proof for this complex is contractible. It's, uh, it's kind of complicated. Um, they use different kind of techniques. So, but maybe I should sort of to explain to you how the proof does, I want to give you an idea how to show this complex are connected, okay? How this lollipop complex is connected. So, is, so let me just- mm -hmm. is, is the contractibility proof like a Hatcher flow thing or is it a lot more complicated than that? It, it's, uh, it's, more, it's way much more complicated than that, but we use a technique, uh, what is called, Mutual link trick is very similar to, it's also kind of like a flow argument, but, uh, but you cannot directly apply uh, 
Yeah, uh, you, you will see the proof. You cannot directly apply, uh, apply the Hutch's flow argument because you have at some point you have to pass a, a, a admissible loop instead of a, a mark point or a boundary point. Yeah. Okay, is there any more questions? But, but in the proof, we use uh, combinations. It's a better simplest, simplest argument to combine with uh, um, what we call mutual link chip, which is kind of like a flow argument. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so let me give you an idea. So I first draw a lollipop here. Then I draw a second lollipop. Let's say I want to make it into two. Complicate. Okay, so so this will be my alpha. This will be my beta. I want to show alpha and beta are connected, right? So these are two vertices. So the first step is I I want to modify alpha. Okay. So the, the way, so, so sort of, I saw there's some difficulties, this, the up part of beta sort of going through the interior, the disk bounded by, by the loop part of alpha. So these things makes me worry. So what I do is I, I, I found some loop, admissible loop lies inside lies in, in, inside this uh, sort of lollipop. And then I just choose an arc connecting it. Okay. It could even intersect with, uh, with the arc part of beta. I don't, I don't care at this moment. But the thing is, uh, I know, so I'll call this alpha prime. So this alpha prime is very easy to see that it's connected to alpha, not directly, but through some other third part because this thing is restricted in a small neighborhood and this complement. So you can just choose, in, say, a gamma here. So, you know, there's a gamma connected to both. So, but let me erase it now. Okay. So, so now I have changed alpha to alpha prime, right? But there's uh, another layer of difficulty. Uh, which is the arc part of alpha prime, there's intersection, sorry. There's intersection. Actually, there could be more than one intersection. And for that, we, we sort of using a flow argument, but it's not exactly, it's, it's more like an advanced version of the flow argument. So what we call the mutual link trick. So this is, uh, this is, uh, so, so at the beginning we call it Putman streak, and then because because Kyle Taiwo told me that he learned this from Putman, but then uh, he also told me that there are people tell him that uh, before Putman there are people using this already. So at the end we we call this streak uh, mutual link streak, but but it is some kind of flow argument. So let let me tell you how the flow works. So what you do is you choosing the choosing the intersection point closes to, to this admissible loop and then you draw a line parallel to it, right? And then you replace this, you know, the other part stays the same. So this will be your beta prime, okay? And beta and beta prime are very close to each other except at this point. And, and then you can find some other loop. So, so beta and beta prime are different, but uh, the key thing is the link of beta and beta, beta prime, the intersection is connected. And in the picture, you can actually very easy to see, you can find some uh, say gamma double prime, which is connected to beta and beta prime. Okay, and then now you just need to show half prime and beta prime are connected. In my picture, they are already connected because they are already, uh, I resolved all the intersecting points, but in reality, you probably have more intersecting points, but that you can push it off from loop part of alpha step by step. 
and at the end, you getting that uh, they are connected. Okay. So I think I'll stop here. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, speaker. <clears throat> Are there any questions? I have some uh, maybe curious question. <clears throat> um, I know that if you if you take so this is going to be a little bit. Uh, um, um, unrelated to, to these groups, but uh, maybe a high dimensional mm -hmm. version. So if you take counter set, cross counter set. Yeah. Um, I know that the homeomorphism of this uh, two dimensional counter set is not isomorphic to homeomorphism of counter set. Mm -hmm. so this suggests that um, there should be high dimensional versions of these Thompson's groups. Yes, yes, there is. Uh, these are called the uh, brain, brain Thompson group. I see. And, and, yeah. and what are known, known results about them? Uh, so they are, they, are, they are known to be type F infinity. And, but their homology, I think, uh, very little is known. I guess at some point, uh, so that, that was a long time ago. Um, Peter Putz and, and I, we were, we were considering whether, uh, so, but I think maybe that's the wrong direction. So, so uh, what, is no, what, is, what should be the notion, brain Thompson group? Uh, uh, so yeah, the yeah, I think they using V. So so you can have one V including in two V, and including N V, and and this gives you a sequence of groups. Mm -hmm. So for for some time, uh, Peter Pascal and Peter and I were considering whether this family of groups that finds homology stability, but uh, unsuccessful. Oh. Yeah. This is uh, when the dimension increases. It's sort of natural, right? You have S, L, and Z, all these, uh, I don't know, arithmetic groups. Say, I mean, when you consider homology stability, the dimension already always increases. Somehow. Yeah, for, for homeomorphism, we can't just say the homology is not interesting because all of them are acyclic. So, mm -hmm. in a way, it's, yeah. it's homology isomorphism, but for trivial reasons. Uh, yeah. Yes. Well, it's already, I guess, 1.30 a.m. in time. Yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, yeah. so. I, at some point, I thought uh, it, it stopped at 1.15, because our office and our office stops at 15, so I got confused. I guess my mind is on off. Yeah. <laughs> no, that was great. You didn't feel very sleepy. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah, let me stop.